Hey guys, Alton here. First off, I want to say thanks for checking out my YouTube channel. And for today's video, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a look at one of my selected lectures from my best selling 10 and a half hour introduction to information security management course. So let's go ahead and let's get into it. In this video, we're going to talk about hardening systems. And when we talk about hardening systems in this lecture, we're focusing in on end user systems, such as the Windows 10 operating system. Now, why aren't we talking about servers? Well, it's because I have a separate lecture for server hardening as well. Now, before we get into this, understand that you're going to see a lot of overlap between these two different lectures, the system hardening and the server hardening lectures are going to have a lot of the same topics. Well, because the applications and methods in which we harden an end user system versus a server is going to be the same in many instances. But I tried to put some things within this lecture that aren't covered on the server hardening, um, things that are really specific to end user systems. So let's go ahead and let's get started. So the whole goal of hardening a system is to reduce its attack surface. And if we think about it, any means that malicious code such as malware or a bad actor such as a hacker or script kitty can utilize to get into our system, that's the attack surface. And the smaller we make that, the less vulnerable a system is going to be to potential attacks, to potential vulnerabilities. And so that's our goal with hardening systems. So let's talk about the methodology in which we can do so. So the first two on the left go hand in hand. Blocking unused ports and disabling unnecessary services and protocols go hand in hand because services and protocols have associated logical ports assigned to them. So if we have a system that doesn't need to be running a specific service or protocol, and it doesn't need to have a port that's open listing for connections for the network, then we should disable them because having unnecessary services and protocols and ports open are just going to expand and increase our attack surface. And of course, we want to reduce it. So make sure that we disable our unnecessary services, protocols, and ports. Now, when we're talking about ports, we can also talk about physical ports, such as our USB ports and our CD drive on our systems and any other sort of a physical port where you can connect some sort of a medium to that system. We can physically block those or we can disable them as well within the operating systems. And typically that can be done with some sort of security policy such as a group policy object within the Windows environment, which is typically what we're gonna see. Now, secondly, we also need to make sure that we're disabling and deleting unnecessary user accounts. So for example, within the Windows operating system, there's a guest account. If we don't need that, let's go ahead and disable or delete it. And the same thing goes for end users within our organization. We're talking about provisioning and deprovisioning user accounts. If somebody is being fired or somebody's leaving the organization, well, right when they're doing their exit interview with HR, we need to deprovision their account so they can't go back to their desk and get back onto the network and onto the system. It locks them out the minute that they are doing their exit interview and they're talking to HR. We also need to make sure that we keep our system up to date. So we need to make sure that we have some sort of patching policy in place to make sure that our end user systems are patched on a regular basis. We also need to make sure that we utilize anti-malware software. And when I talk about anti-malware software, a lot of organizations just simply call that antivirus software. But because there's so many different types of malware out there now, in addition to just viruses, a lot of these are really just anti-malware software. They're just not only focusing on viruses, but they're focusing on worms, Trojan horses, and so forth. So we want to make sure that we have anti-malware software installed on all of our end user systems. Additionally, 
we want to make sure that we're utilizing our software firewall. Specifically on Windows 10, it comes with a built-in software firewall, and we want to make sure that that's enabled as well. And blocking services and protocols as well that don't need to have or shouldn't have a connection onto our network. We can also consider utilizing disk encryption, and that could either be something such as what we looked at in this course, the Windows encrypted file system, which allows us to encrypt a file by file or folder by folder, or we could use something such as full disk encryption as well. There are third party solutions within the Windows operating system. There's also BitLocker, which is full disk encryption. So that's going to provide us some extra confidentiality on our servers as well and our systems. So any sort of a system, whether it's a server or an end user system, if you wanna make sure that if somebody gets a hold of that system and that data, and even if they steal it and steal that hard drive, if we wanna make sure they can't read anything, go ahead and utilize full disk encryption because, well, if we're encrypting it with something such as AES, they're not gonna be able to decrypt it unless they have the associated key. And then lastly, something that I want to talk about that really applies to end user systems, and it also applies to servers, but not as much to servers, is to employ a BIOS password. And the reason that we want to employ a BIOS password on our end user systems is that the physical security of these systems aren't going to be as great as they are on the servers. Because if we think about it, if we're walking through an office, there's a bunch of cubicles and the cubicles may have a separate computer in each, such as a desktop. Well, somebody should just go into a cubicle, restart it, and boot up into the BIOS, and if we don't have it password protected, they can get into it. So physical security is fairly poor on systems for end users, whereas physical security on servers is typically fairly robust. They may be in a dedicated server room that's behind a locked door, maybe it's behind a man trap, and maybe they have server cages that are locked as well. So because we have poor physical security for end user systems, we would definitely want to make sure that we enable and and utilize a BIOS password. So this is not entirely comprehensive. This doesn't talk about everything you should do, but these are some of the high points, some important things that you really should consider when you're looking to harden your systems. So in our video on server hardening, we're gonna talk about a lot of the same things, but we also have some other things as well that we don't talk about in here. So if you have any questions, please let me know. If not, thanks for watching and I'll see you at the next video. Take care. Well, I hope that you enjoyed today's video and you learned a lot from it. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up and also consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. Now, if you're interested in taking this full course or just learning more about it, check out the video description down below because I've included a link where you can learn more about the course and enroll into it if you'd like. So again, thanks for watching my video. I appreciate it and I look forward to seeing you guys at the next video. Take care.